ladies and gentlemen, I hope everyone is having a great day. My name is Naomi Hart and I'm a teenager who's trying to make a difference. I began my radio show when I was 11 years old wanting to make a change to expose what is wrong and to change what is wrong. I would like you to thank you for listening to my broadcast as my radio show is 100% listener supported. We are funded through the listeners for support and donations. If you could be so kind to find your heart to donate on my website, www.crystalkidsradio.com, I will keep it up. And the piece will come in to continue my radio show. You can also go to my website to see articles that I post. Ladies and gentlemen, today's show is so informative. On August 6, 2014, celebrated the 69th anniversary of the Hiroshima atomic bombing. And tomorrow, August 9, 2014, will be the 69th anniversary of the bombings in Nagasaki. How many people died from these two bombings? How much health problems has it caused? Health defects? How many children has died from te- a terrible death because of this? Then Fukushima would happen in 2011, where Fukushima would cause damage to the Pacific Ocean and to the Japanese public. Today's show will be about the 69th anniversary of the bombings and about how nuclear power is dangerous. I'm going to be interviewing about all of us, Dr. Gordon Edwards. For those who do not know who he is, he was born in Canada in the year 1940. And he graduated from the University of Toronto in 1961 with a gold medal in mathematics and physics. In 1972, he obtained a PhD in mathematics from Queen's University. From 1970 to 1974, he was the editor of Survival Magazine. Then in 1975, he co-founded the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. His website is www.ccnr.org, where you can see his written articles and reports on radiation standards, radioactive waste, uranium mining. He has also written many other th- about many other things as well. Dr. Gordon Edwards received a Nuclear Free Future Award in the year 2006. We're educational, so please listen. I hope you're doing well today. Thank you for making some time out of your busy schedule, and it's a real pleasure to have you back. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie Marie. I'm happy to be back. It is a pleasure to have you on my show again. And I'd like to tell you, I respect you for what you're doing. You are doing a great job to inform the public about nuclear power and its dangers. And leading the anti-nuclear movement, there's people like you that make changes, real changes. You're a true Canadian hero who is waking up the eyes. You have opened up my eyes and you're opening the eyes of the next generation of children. You are opening the doors. You're really an inspiration to educating the public. <laughs> well, the really important thing is uh, mm-hmm. people have to not only be educated, but they have to really have the will to act. And uh, the important thing, the most important thing about nuclear power uh, in terms of its dangers to humanity is the connection with nuclear weapons, because nuclear weapons really are doomsday devices. They really are able to eliminate or set back four billion years of evolution of life on this planet. And uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's not a uh, threat from outer space. It's a threat from ourselves. You know, We ourselves, the humans, we have invented these weapons, the so-called weapons, but really they're not weapons because a weapon presupposes that you can use it against somebody else and somehow gain something as a result of that. But these weapons are so horrible that they just, spend the, they, they just spell the end of civilization if they're used in a massive way. And uh, that's not really a weapon, that's just suicide. Mm-hmm. Yes, and today is the day when the Hiroshima atomic bombing happened. That is August 6th. Let's talk about Hiroshima. The atomic bombing today would have happened at Hiroshima if they fold a uranium gun-type atomic bomb. Then on August 9th, the city of Nagasaki, a plutonium implosive-type bomb was used. The Hiroshima atomic bombing anniversary is 69 years. Since the atomic bombing in both cities, how much has it caused death, defects in children? How much has it affected the Japanese public? And is it still to this day affecting the people? Well, yeah, it is still affecting the people. But the the important thing here is that, you see, um, it's important to realize that the Canada was involved in the bombing of Hiroshima, actually. Um, it, two years before the bombing of Hiroshima, which was in 1945, August 6th, as you said, um, there was a, a meeting mm-hmm. of uh, the three heads of state in Quebec City. It was called the Quebec Conference. 
and it was a meeting between Prime Minister Mackenzie King, um, President Roosevelt, and uh, Prime Minister Churchill of Britain. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1943, in August of 1943. And they signed a secret agreement there to cooperate the three countries in developing the world's first atomic bombs. Now, uh, the project was already uh, started, it was already underway, but it was important for these three countries to be involved because, and why was Canada involved in this? Well, the reason is because Canada had the only readily available source of uranium, and uranium is the key of all nuclear technology, whether civilian or military, whether it's nuclear weapons or whether it's nuclear reactors, none of it would be possible without uranium, and Canada happened to have a uranium mine in operation in the Northwest Territories, way up, way up near the Arctic Circle on uh, Great Bear Lake, one of the one of the not one of the Great Lakes, but uh, nevertheless a very large one, and um, it was called Port Radium, uh, and that mine was opened up in 1931, not to mine uranium, but to mine another substance called radium. Radium at that time uh, was being used for a variety of purposes. Some of them good and many of them stupid um, and uh, and as a result of using radium a lot of people died from handling it because it's very very dangerous substance but um, but they knew the scientists knew that wherever you find radium on earth you also find uranium and uranium turns out to be the only element that nat occurs in nature that you can use to make an atomic bomb there's no other element naturally occurring that can be used for that purpose now, uh, um, here's the thing. Uh, if, if we just put it bluntly, I don't know how much your listeners know about uh, the chemical elements, but before 1945, there were 92 chemical elements, and they all have a number. They're numbered from 1 to 92. And mm -hmm. number 1 is hydrogen. It's the lightest. And then number yeah. 2 is helium. It's the next lightest. And number 3 is uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and so on and so on. It goes through the table, and number 92 is the heaviest naturally occurring element, and it happens to be uranium. Now, uh, what was discovered in 1939, well, actually, just around Christmas time in 1938, so just as the year was changing from 1938 to 1939, it was discovered that you could actually, with uranium, uh, there's a certain rare kind of uranium which can be used to generate an enormous amount of energy, to release an enormous amount of energy, by actually splitting the, the, the nucleus of the atom. Now, an atom is sort of like a miniature solar system. You could think of it that way. And uh, the counterpart of the sun, the center of the solar system, the center of the atom, is called the nucleus of the atom. And then around that nucleus, you have these orbiting electrons. So you have electrons orbiting around. And in the case of uranium, which is element number 92, mm -hmm. there would normally be 92 electrons orbiting around the, uh, the nucleus. And the nucleus itself has 92, ele uh, 92 particles called protons. And uh, that's what makes it uranium. That's what makes it an atom of uranium. This number 92 turns out to be the magic number. Well, they discovered that uh, under certain circumstances, the uranium atom can actually break apart into two smaller pieces, two or three smaller pieces. Uh, they're kind of like chunks or, or uh, um, broken pieces of uranium atoms. And, uh, and in the process of splitting the atom apart, there's an enormous amount of energy released. And when I say enormous, I mean millions of times more energy than you would get from the most violent chemical explosion. So when you think about a chemical explosion, you know, think, of the, think about these huge explosions you see that bring down entire buildings. Um, if you look at the, uh, the energy per atom, it's millions of times less than the energy you get from splitting a, a uranium atom. And uh, mm -hmm. the main difference here is that uh, the uranium atom, the energy comes right from the nucleus. That's why it's called nuclear energy. Whereas in these other chemical explosions, the, the power yeah. of the explosion comes from the electrons. It doesn't come from the nucleus. So those are non-nuclear or chemical explosives. But nuclear explosives have the power not only to wipe out an entire city at a time, so that two cities, you know, there was the Hiroshima, the city of Hiroshima, one bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima, 
And over 100,000 people were killed almost instantly. Well, not instantly, over a couple of days, because of the, the, uh, the death doesn't always occur right away. But it occurs rapidly. And, uh, and not only uh, does it kill people immediately, mm-hmm. but there are also lingering effects. So the people who were exposed to radiation and otherwise recovered from the explosion, otherwise recovered from the, the bombing uh, and survived... They, those people started developing various kinds of cancers and other diseases many, many years later. And I, when I say many years, I mean 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. So that the effects of that, yeah. uh, that exposure to the atomic radiation that is given off when the bomb explodes are still having their effects today by, uh, on the uh, survivors, the so-called survivors of the atomic bomb. There's even a hospital in Hiroshima which is dedicated only to survivors of the bombing so that the only people who can use this hospital are the people who are uh, so-called habaksha. Habaksha is a Japanese word meaning children of the bomb. And, uh, and they're, still, they're still keeping track of uh, the, the cancers that are caused by, by that exposure. But the important thing to remember here is that this, although horrible as this was, it was one city, but remember, we're talking about men, women, and children I mean, when we talk about terrorist attacks or suicide bombings, you know, we talk about the World Trade Center. 3,000 people died. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. But we're talking here about 100,000 people dying right away. And these are men, women, and children. These are not soldiers, uh, per se. They're just ordinary citizens living in a city. So um, you could say this is the ultimate terror weapon, and the ultimate uh, act of terror is uh, just incinerating an entire city. And, of course, people are concerned about the fact that these bombs, if they're not eliminated altogether from, the, from Earth, then these bombs are, one day, they're going to be used again. Um, hopefully not, but we know from history that you just can't have weapons lying around and expect that nobody's ever going to use them. And, in fact, we do have uh, countries and organizations which have stated that they would be prepared to use these weapons. Even the NATO organization, you know, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, of which the United States is a major partner here, and many other countries in Europe belong to this, and Canada belongs to it. Um, NATO has an explicit policy that if they were in a military engagement, if they were in a mm-hmm. military, if they were in a war, and they were losing, and they were unable to win by using conventional weapons, that is, chemical weapons, that they would be prepared to be the first to use nuclear weapons. So um, this is not something that you have to, this is not something to be treated lightly. This is something that is a, a, a real threat to humanity. And not only a threat to humanity, but a threat to the entire planet, even other mm-hmm. species of life. So this is a, the, the reason why this is such a threat to, to the whole planet is that when those bombs were used against Japan, Japan did not have nuclear weapons. But suppose you had two countries that both had nuclear weapons, like, for example, India and Pakistan. They, they both have nuclear weapons, and they're right side by side. If they mm-hmm. ever got into a war where they started using nuclear weapons, not only would they create tremendous death and carnage and and poisoning of the ecosystems in that area but there would be so much uh, um, there's so there would be so much so many ashes and um, um, huge fires cities on fire that would throw so much soot into the atmosphere that it would actually block out the sunlight all over the all over the northern hemisphere and would interfere with with crops even in North America even in Canada the crops would not be able to grow properly because of the blotting out of the sun from the ashes of the fires of these, uh, of these bombs. It's called a nuclear winter. And the idea of a nuclear winter is that even a limited use of nuclear weapons, I'm talking about maybe a few mm-hmm. dozen nuclear weapons used by each side, uh, would be enough to cause almost an immediate climate change. It wouldn't be climate warming. It would be climate cooling really, really rapidly, and it would, happen, it would happen virtually overnight. It wouldn't happen over a period of 10, 20, 30 years. It would happen very quickly. And uh, so the consequences can be very dire. And for that reason, almost every world leader that has had time to reflect upon this, usually the world leaders have retired from office before they come to the realization 
that these weapons absolutely have to be eliminated. If we don't eliminate these weapons, then humanity is not going to have uh, much of a chance to survive indefinitely, you know, to have a sustainable future. So that's why it's such a priority. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And we need to look at these issues because people are now looking at these issues and the, tri and the nuclear industry is really trying to hide making it look like nuclear is good when it is not good. Well, you see, the nuclear industry, uh, they subscribe to the point of view um, that, well, uranium is the key, as I said. Uranium is the key element, element number 92. Now, they, they say, well, yes, you can use this weapon, for, you can use uranium for, for terrible purposes for these atomic bombs, but you can also use it for good purposes to produce energy that will be beneficial to people. That, uh, so what do they do in a nuclear reactor? Well, in a nuclear reactor, they use uranium as a fuel, and they split the uranium atoms under a controlled fashion. They, they can split it in a controlled way so that uh, you do not have a nuclear explosion. Instead, you just have an, an enormous amount of heat being generated, and this mm -hmm. heat can be used to boil water. The water turns to steam, and the steam can then be used to turn a wheel, a turbine, and generate electricity. This is very much the same way that they generate electricity using coal or oil or even wood burning. Anything that can be used to boil water can be used to generate electricity by using a steam turbine. And so from that point of view, you could say nuclear power is really just another way to boil water. But the problem is that even while it's being used peacefully, this uranium, um, something happens inside the core of the reactor, inside of the heart of the reactor, that is uh, very dangerous in terms of weapons. Because some of the uranium that is not being split, because not all the uranium atoms are split, only some of them are being split, the ones that are not being split are actually changing into a new substance that doesn't exist on Earth naturally, and it's called plutonium. And plutonium is element number 94. Now, there is no element 94. You can't go around the world and find element 94. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as a mine for plutonium because it's not there. But it is created inside the reactor. What happens inside the reactor is some of these uranium atoms absorb little are particles called neutrons. And when they absorb a neutron, um, it turns into a new element called plutonium. That's how plutonium is created. Plutonium turns out to be even a better nuclear explosive than uranium. And in fact, as you mentioned in your, uh, when you were introducing uh, us to the audience, you mentioned that uh, not only was the bomb, was an atomic bomb dropped on the city of Hiroshima on August the 6th, but only three days later, a second bomb mm -hmm. was dropped on the city of Nagasaki. And that bomb did not use uranium as an explosive material. It used plutonium. How did the plutonium, how was the plutonium made? It was made from a nuclear reactor. So they built nuclear reactors in the United States. They used uranium as fuel in those nuclear reactors. They produced the plutonium, and then they used the plutonium for the bomb. So here's the problem. Uranium just cannot be separated from bombs. On the one hand, either you end up using it directly for bombs, or you end up using it as fuel. But if you use it as fuel, it turns into plutonium, and that plutonium mm -hmm. can then be used for bombs. So uh, we're, we're into a kind of a circle, a vicious circle. How do we escape from the loop? Now, for this reason, many people have concluded that the best thing to do is just not use uranium, not, not mine uranium, leave it in the ground. In fact, there's a, there's a Nobel Prize-winning organization of medical doctors called the International Physicians for the prevention of nuclear war. And they have been around for a long time, and they won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. And the reason they won the Nobel Peace Prize is because they, uh, all over the world, in Russia, in America, in France, in Britain, in all the countries that have nuclear weapons, as well as all the countries that do not have nuclear weapons, they, they took out ads in newspapers saying, listen, in the event of a nuclear war, don't expect us doctors to be able to help you because there is no cure for nuclear war. When nuclear, wars ha when nuclear wars occur, the hospitals will be blown up. The doctors and nurses will be incinerated. They will be unable to help you. And so you can't count on the medical profession 
to to really assist you to recover after a nuclear war because they'll be affected just as badly as you are. And what they did was they tried to bring common sense to the top leadership of uh, of various countries in order to get an agreement to actually completely eliminate these weapons. Now, if you want to completely eliminate these weapons, you really also have to eliminate, many people believe, the traffic in uranium. Because as long as uranium is in circulation, then it's either going to end up in nuclear weapons or it's going to end up in nuclear power plants, and then it can be used for nuclear weapons. So the best thing they figure is to just stop mining uranium. And in fact, just a few years ago, I think it was three years ago, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War had an annual Mm -hmm. conference in... Basel, Switzerland, and I was there as a Canadian delegate. And at that conference, they passed a resolution saying that there should be a worldwide ban on uranium mining, that there shouldn't be any more uranium mining anywhere. Because, not because uranium might not do some good sometimes, but because the dangers of getting this stuff onto the surface and into circulation is far too dangerous for the human race and for the survival of the planet. It's not worth the benefits. Whatever benefits there are, they're not equal to the risks, and we should just leave it in the ground. Yes, I have to agree with you. L- let's talk a little bit more about uranium. Like, Who has banned it and who has allowed uranium mining to continue? Well, um, who has a lot of uranium? Canada has a lot of uranium. And another country, uh, part of the Soviet Union uh, once upon a time, called Kazakhstan, uh, has become recently the number one exporter of uranium. That was just a couple of years ago. Prior to that, Canada was the largest producer and exporter of uranium from the very beginning. And in fact, Canada is the country that had the very first uranium mine um, because, as I mentioned to you earlier, Um, In 1943, there was an agreement of the three countries, uh, including Canada, UK, uh, USA, and Canada, to work together in cooperation on building the world's first atomic bomb. And they signed an agreement called the Quebec Agreement. And this agreement has had three uh, important points to it. Number one was that they would work together to develop the atomic bomb, Number two was they would not use this bomb against each other under any circumstances. And number three is that they would not use it against any third party unless they had unanimous agreement. So as a result of this, um, our Prime Minister, Mackenzie King at the time, the Canadian Prime Minister, had to be consulted and asked whether it was okay to use the bombs against Japan. And of course, he said yes. And that marked the end of World War II. Now, You might say, and many people have said, well, if it put an end to the war, then maybe it was worth it. But, you know, the war was already over, in fact. The war was really already over because Germany had already surrendered a year before. And Japan was going to be surrendering in a short time. It was only a matter of time. Um, So the use of this bomb was really um, contrary to the whole motivation in in the first place. When they first started building this bomb... They didn't really intend to use it. The, the motivation they gave to the scientists who worked on the project was, look, Hitler might be developing an atomic bomb. And if Hitler is developing an atomic bomb, he would probably want to use it against his enemies. So we better develop our own atomic bomb so we can say to Hitler, hey, don't use that bomb because we've got one too. And we'll use it against you if you use it against somebody else. So the whole idea of the World War II atomic bomb project was actually not to use it against cities, but to prevent its use, to to stop uh, evil people from using this. So uh, the result of this is that why on um, why then was it used against Japan, where there was not even a possibility that they had atomic weapons, and um, and many people feel that it was a uh, it was a terrible decision and one that uh, was really a crime against humanity when you really look at it. Um, it was the ultimate terrorist act in that sense. And uh, uh, two of them, three, two cities within three days, you know, destroyed like that. Uh, incredible. So um, there's a funny thing about these, these bombs is that once they're built, the original rationale for building them seems to get lost in the shuffle. And sooner or later, people end up using them even though they said they never would. And that's why we really have to get rid of them. Now, 
There is, in, in, in Canada, we had most of the uranium that was easily available at that time, uh, back in the time of the Second World War. And after the Second World War, the uranium industry in Canada became very, very large. There were dozens of mines, uranium mines, opened up all over Canada, mostly in Ontario, the Northwest Territories, and Saskatchewan, northern Saskatchewan. This is where the mines were located. And up until 1965, that's from 1945 to 1965, 20 years, all of Canada's uranium was sold for the building of atomic bombs. It was, build, it was sold only for military contracts because that was the only use it had at that time. And, um, and the Canadian uranium industry was so large mm -hmm. that in 1959, it was the fourth most important industry in Canada for, in terms of exports. So that the, you know that what Canada exports, we, we export a lot of wood uh, for lumber. We export a lot of pulp for paper. We export a lot of wheat for yes, food. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one was uranium. It was the fourth most important export from Canada in 1959. And it was all for bombs. So, in fact, the building up of the nuclear arsenals, we, we still have today 17,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. 17,000 of them. Mm -hmm. And most of them are in the United States of America. So, um, and, of course, many of them are in Russia. And the other countries that have them are Britain and France and China. So these five countries are known as the nuclear weapon states. And they're the ones that have nuclear arsenals. Since that time, there have been other countries that have developed nuclear weapons. Uh, for example, India and Pakistan have both developed nuclear weapons. And so has Israel and so has North Korea. So now we've got up to nine countries that we know for sure has nuclear weapons. And the problem is, it doesn't look like it's going to stop unless we really put an end to it by saying there won't be any more of this material made available, period. Um, so there was a treaty signed. In, uh, uh, let me just backtrack a little bit, if I may, okay? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Going back, going back to this, uh, this time when Canada was proudly uh, selling uh, uranium for bombs, um, Canadians didn't know very much about it, really. Mo the, uh, Canadian citizens, they didn't really know a whole lot about it because a lot of it was secret. It was very secretive, and uh, people didn't really understand what was going on. But, of course, the government did, and the government felt that it was, they were proud of this because they felt that, well, we're, we are in a cold war between you know, the Western countries and the Soviet Union. You know, and the, uh, in those days, it's hard for children and, and even grown-ups today to realize how much fear there was. You know, fear of the Russians, and the Russians were equally feared of the Americans. And on both sides, young people would have nightmares at night because they would think that they were going to, their cities were going to be blown up uh, suddenly uh, by some atomic bomb. Uh, uh, I knew friends when I went to university who really uh, were almost hysterical. They were so afraid of uh, the idea that uh, nuclear weapons could be launched any moment. It could, could happen any moment by just the push of a button. And within, within a couple of hours, it would be all over. So um, it's a very scary prospect. Now, that prospect has not disappeared. Mm -hmm. Because we still have, I mentioned to you that there's like 17,000 nuclear weapons, yes. but 5,000 of those weapons are still on uh, mm -hmm. what is sometimes described as hair trigger alert. It means that they can be launched within a matter of minutes. Within a couple of minutes, they could be launched. And when they're launched, they, they are basically missiles, but these missiles, they don't really, they're not guided they, um, they're called intercontinental ballistic missiles. And ballistic missiles are ones that are launched into an orbit. And once they're launched, you can't call them back again. You know, that once they're in the air, they're going to their target. And uh, that's all there is to it. So the idea that this is uh, an irrevocable decision that can be made by somebody. Uh, and, of course, once these bombs start exploding, the, the philosophy of both countries was that well, we have our nuclear arsenal to defend us because if the other country were to launch a nuclear weapon, we would immediately launch all of our nuclear weapons because it would be a question of using them or losing them. So if you don't launch them right away, then the other side might destroy your arsenal. They might destroy your weapons on the ground before you even have a chance to get them into the air. 
So therefore, they had this philosophy that it's really important to have it on hair trigger alert so that as soon as, if one city got exploded by an atomic bomb, then you'd have to decide within a couple of minutes whether it's time to launch all your nuclear weapons at the so-called enemy. And of course, this, is, this, this doctrine was called MAD, which spells MAD, but what it meant was mutually assured destruction. They felt the best way to preserve the peace is to have a, a balance of terror, that both sides are terrified to use their nuclear weapons because they know that if they use them, that they would suffer, they would be wiped off the map. They would be wiped off the face of the earth. And, of course, that would happen to both sides. And so it, it really is a suicide pact. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a, mutually, a mutually assured suicide. Now, the problem is that uh, this might have some kind of insane logic when you only have two countries facing off against each other. But nowadays, we've got many countries. We've got nine countries, and God knows how many more there will be and we also have the possibility that criminal organizations or terrorists could get their hands on these weapons or even build their own by using the materials. And in that case, um, you could have, well, as one guy said in the United States, he was, an, he was actually an advisor to President Reagan when, when Reagan was president of the United States. He said, we could wake up one day and find Washington, D.C. gone and not even know who did it. So where is your mutually assured... Where's, where's your balance of terror in that case? You don't even know who did it. Who are you going to retaliate against? And, you know, uh, so it all comes down to this question then of, uh, of how do we get ourselves out of this, of, of this mess that we've dug ourselves into. Okay, so let's go back to 1965. Up until 1965, Canada sold all of its uranium for weapons. In 1965, our Prime Minister, Lester Pearson, uh, made an announcement in the House of Commons, which was uh, government policy from that, from that day to this, and that is that henceforth Canada will not sell uranium for military purposes. It will only sell uranium for peaceful purposes. So this ushered in the age of the peaceful atom, the age of uranium for peaceful purposes. And we started... Uh, well, selling nuclear reactors, sometimes giving them away to other countries, and uh, exporting uranium all over the world. Um, in fact, 85% uh, of the uranium that's mined in Canada gets exported to other countries. And once it's out of the country, of course, uh, it's pretty hard for us to keep track of what happens to it, uh, although uh, there are international organizations that try to look after that, the International Atomic Energy Agency, for example. But here's what happened. We gave a nuclear reactor to India, just a small reactor. It wasn't, a, it wasn't even an electricity generating reactor. It was a research mm -hmm. reactor. And um, it was actually a carbon copy of the reactor we had at Chalk River called the NRX reactor. We use this reactor here in Canada. And uh, what most of the Canadian public didn't know is that one of the things we did with that reactor while it was operating is that it produced plutonium, right? Like I said before, some of the uranium gets changed into plutonium. Mm -hmm. Well, we were selling the plutonium to the United States military also. So in addition to selling uranium, we were also selling plutonium. Now, the plutonium that we were selling was just a small fraction of what the Americans already had. But nevertheless, that's what we were doing with it. So we were selling this plutonium, and it was for use in bombs. So the Indians who got, our, who got this reactor as a gift... They knew that, uh, that this reactor could be used to produce plutonium, and that plutonium could be used for bombs, and that's exactly what they did. They, they used the reactor for research, but on the side they produced plutonium, and on the side they used that plutonium to produce a bomb, and they exploded it in 1974. That was almost 10 years after we had adopted the Atoms for Peace program. 1974, that's nine years after. And... Uh, well, the Canadian government was absolutely furious and said, well, you know, you said you weren't going to use this material for, for, for military purposes. And the Indians said, oh, well, no, no, don't misunderstand. This is not a weapon. This is not a military bomb. This is a peaceful bomb. This is a bomb that we're developing for, you know, like you might use dynamite to take out a stump or you might use explosives to create a harbor. 
well, we're, we're, we're thinking of using nuclear bombs uh, for civilian purposes. <laughs> so, well, mm-hmm. the Canadians and the Americans and everybody else around the world realize that this is a very dangerous idea, yep. even though they're the ones who actually started it, because the Americans and the Russians were both talking about using, using nuclear bombs for peaceful purposes also. So they sort of opened, the, opened this, uh, what do yeah. you call it, this, they kind of opened this horror show by, uh, by putting forward the idea that these bombs could be used for civilian purposes. Well, all of a sudden they realize that this is crazy because if we let people, if we let countries around the world develop their own bombs and say they're using them for peaceful purposes, then what's the difference between using them for peaceful purposes and using them for military purposes? It's just the will of the government, right? It's just the spur-of-the-moment decision as to how you use them. So um, at that point, they, 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 made a, a, they introduced a new document into the world, which was uh, called the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And they got almost every country in the world, except for a handful, has signed this treaty. It's called the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the idea of this treaty is that it basically says that the countries who sign this document who don't already have nuclear weapons promise not to get them. They promise not to develop nuclear weapons. And that includes any kind of nuclear explosive, never mind peaceful bombs. There are no such thing as peaceful bombs. You can't develop nuclear bombs, mm-hmm. period. Yeah. Uh, but in exchange for that, so, so what you had here was you had the countries that had nuclear weapons were not obliged necessarily to get rid of them, though. They were, they were allowed to keep their nuclear weapons, but, they, but they, there was an article in the treaty called Article 6, which said that they have to negotiate a complete end to nuclear weapons. In other words, they have to enter into good faith negotiations to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. And that's what hasn't happened. That's what hasn't happened. So what we have is we have this treaty, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, where all the countries that signed it who don't have nuclear weapons are obliged not to develop them. But the countries that do have nuclear weapons are supposed to get rid of them, but they're not. They're not getting rid of them. Now, they have reduced their arsenals. It's true that there's a lot less nuclear weapons today, even though 17,000 is a huge number. That's a lot less than what they used to have, which is around 40,000 nuclear weapons. So they have reduced their nuclear arsenals, but they have indicated no... They've not given any kind of idea that they're really planning to get rid of them altogether. They're still hanging on to them. And this is the real danger. This whole non-proliferation treaty agreement, you know, when you sign an agreement with somebody else, if if you sign a document which is like a legal document, both sides have obligations. And if one side doesn't live up to their obligations, then the other side says, well, hey, you're not living up to your obligations. Why should I have to live up to mine? And so the treaty falls apart. And that's what a lot of people are worried about, is that this whole non-proliferation treaty is beginning to fall apart because, uh, because the countries that are supposed to get rid of their weapons haven't done so and don't show any signs of doing so. That's where the world is at a crossroads right now. And this is where uh, young people have got to sort of be aware that... Uh, that this is a job their parents should have done. They should have got rid of yes. these weapons, but they haven't succeeded in doing so. And so it's going to be up to the next generation to really, if, for, for the sake of the earth, they're really going to have to get rid of these weapons because if we don't get rid of these weapons, they're going to get rid of us. Yeah, they are, and it's destroying us. If, if They're going to destroy us if we do that, right? That's right, for sure. And they're going to make the planet largely uh, uninhabitable. I mean, look at, for example, what happened at uh, Fukushima uh, in Japan a few years ago, 2011. That's that's already, there might be some of your listeners who, for whom that's only a dim memory, or maybe not even a memory. Maybe they weren't aware of it at the time. But in Fukushima, uh, on the coast of Japan, there were six nuclear reactors at one particular location. Now, Japan has a lot of nuclear reactors. In fact, at that, at that time, in 2011, they had 54 nuclear reactors, quite a lot. But six of them were in this one location, and that's where the tsunami, this huge ocean wave, uh, which was uh, like, like a skyscraper, came sweeping up onto the land and... Uh, 
and it drenched these nuclear reactors and ruined the electrical systems in the nuclear reactors. You know, oftentimes, if you have uh, an electrical system and you flood it with water, it's just not going to work. <laughs> and uh, so what happened was all the backup electricity systems of the nuclear reactors stopped working. And because of that, it was impossible to prevent these reactors from melting down. Now, this is a strange concept, and, and uh, many people don't understand. What does that mean? What do you mean, meltdown? I and mean, why should it melt down? Wouldn't the water sort of put out any fire? <laughs> why would it melt? Um, well, uh, this, this requires a little bit of explanation. It turns out that, as I mentioned before, the way they get the energy in a nuclear power plant is by splitting these uranium atoms, right? But when they split these uranium yeah. atoms, they break into pieces, and it turns out that these pieces are extremely radioactive. And what, what does that mean? Well, it means the, piece, the broken pieces of the uranium atom um, are other elements. Remember I told you about the, the table of elements that goes yes, from number one up to number 92? Mm -hmm. Well, when you break apart a uranium atom, you get two pieces which are lower down on the, on the table of elements but they're very, very unstable. So, for example, we have a substance that exists in nature called iodine. Iodine used to be used for cuts. You put it on a cut, and it uh, helps to heal it. Um, but what, the, what happens is that when you split uranium atoms, you get a radioactive type of iodine. Now, what's that mean? Well, it means it's just exactly like a normal iodine, except it's unstable, and so these atoms are undergoing miniature explosions which are called radioactive disintegrations. Now, let's take, a, let's take a young child. When a young child is drinking milk, for example, you know, drink your milk, it's good for you, right? When a young child drinks milk, mm -hmm. um, it contains a little bit of iodine. There's a iodine in the milk, natural iodine. And this iodine goes to the thyroid gland of the child, and it helps to prevent uh, certain diseases, such as goiter, which is a disease of the thyroid gland. And uh, so it's healthy. It's healthy to have some iodine in your diet. In fact, we even have on our table, we have salt. If you look at the salt, some of your listeners might have noticed that they say on the salt package, iodized salt. Have you ever seen that, iodized salt? Yeah, yeah, what yeah. Well, what that means is that they have actually added iodine to the mm -hmm. salt, which really? isn't normally there, but they've added iodine to the salt. And the reason why is because it's good for the thyroid gland so that when you use a little salt on your food, and you eat the food with the salt on it, some of that iodine goes to your thyroid gland and helps to protect it against disease. So it's an example of what we call preventative medicine, which we don't have enough of in our society. Well, that's all very well and good. But when there's an accident at a nuclear plant, there's another kind of iodine that is given off, which is radioactive iodine. It's called iodine-131. And this does not exist in nature at all. So when you look for radioactive iodine in the natural world, it doesn't exist unless it was made in a nuclear reactor or in a nuclear explosion. So what happens to this radioactive iodine? Well, it also goes to the thyroid gland, but because the atoms are unstable, it kicks, pardon the language, it sort of kicks the hell out of the, out of the thyroid gland, and the thyroid gland becomes damaged as a result of this. Instead of being helped, it's being damaged. And when the thyroid gland is damaged, uh, it can develop into cancer, but it can also develop various uh, problems in the developing child. For example, it can even cause um, uh, mental retardation. It can cause stunted growth. It can cause various uh, organs in the body not to develop properly. So it's very bad, very bad, very bad stuff for the, uh, for the uh, thyroid gland. And, and this comes from the result of splitting the uranium atoms. That, that's what it is. Now, so uh, as a result of this, for example, after the Chernobyl accident, the Chernobyl accident was a nuclear accident that took place almost 30 years ago in the Ukraine, uh, much too long ago for most of your listeners to have remembered, but they probably heard about it. Well, as a result of that nuclear accident, there were over 6,000 children who had to have their thyroid glands uh, surgically removed because uh, of the contamination with iodine-131. And of course... Even though the thyroid gland is removed, they still suffer health effects from it, nevertheless, uh, because of the side effects of the, of the damaged thyroid. 
Um, so this is going on now in Japan. They're they're now studying children. They're they're studying a lot of children in Japan, and they've already found that. Well, they're not quite sure yet, but they, it, it looks it doesn't look good. It looks like maybe the thyroid glands of children in Japan have also been damaged by the iod- radioactive iodine. Yes. But it's unclear. It's mm-hmm. still not crystal clear whether that's uh, what's happening. But there's a lot more iodine, what's called thyroid cancer, being detected that was uh, far more than was ever seen previously. And people are arguing, well, is it because of the nuclear accident or is it because you're looking more closely than you did before and so you're finding more? Uh, Time will tell about that. But, you know, this iodine-131 is only one example out of hundreds of these fission products. Fission products are, by definition, the broken pieces of uranium atoms. So it turns out there's hundreds of different varieties, hundreds of them. So we have another one called cesium-137. Cesium-137 is radioactive, unstable, and doesn't exist in nature. But there is a non-radioactive element called cesium, which does exist in nature and which is harmless. it, it uh, It goes to the muscle tissue. It goes to the meat of animals, for example. Well, that's all very well and good, but when radioactive cesium is released, then the meat of the animals becomes radioactive, and so it becomes unfit for human consumption. So they, they, they can't eat the meat uh, because it's too dangerous for the humans. Um, so this is the problem with, uh, with nuclear power plants is that they create, in the core of the reactor, not only are they producing electricity by boiling water, but they're also building up a huge inventory of these radioactive byproducts called fission products. And uh, now here's the, here's the amazing thing. The amazing thing, that's bad enough, yes. right? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. when you hear that, you say, wow, mm-hmm. that certainly doesn't sound good. Yeah. And uh, the worst thing is that we don't know how to get rid of these things once they're created, so they become a, a terrible problem. It's called nuclear waste. What do we do with the nuclear waste? And they're talking about trying to bury it somewhere in some hole in the ground where it won't bother the human environment forever. You know, it'll just be safe forever, buried down there underground. Um, But when you have an accident, this stuff is released. So uh, you could say that the nuclear power plant is not just a machine for generating electricity, but it's also a warehouse of these very dangerous radioactive poisons. And that's what makes it doubly dangerous. Now, the amazing thing is, that because the atoms are disintegrating, these uh, fission products, because they're disintegrating very rapidly, they're millions mm-hmm. of times more radioactive than the uranium that started out with that you started out with. Mm-hmm. And because of that, there's a lot of heat being generated that you cannot shut off. That when they shut down the nuclear reactor, the heat keeps being generated. There's more heat being added all the time. Why? Not because of any fire but because these atoms are disintegrating, and when they disintegrate, they give off energy, and that energy is felt as heat. And if you don't remove that heat by circulating water, by flushing water through the core of the reactor, then the temperature is going to go up and up and up and up. And it goes up so high that the fuel itself starts to melt. And it melts at a, at a huge yeah. temperature. It's like 2,800 degrees Celsius, 2,800 degrees Celsius. That's very, very hot. That's almost twice as hot as the melting point of steel. Mm-hmm. So, so when you get to this temperature, the fuel starts melting like candle wax. And because it's such a high temperature, it melts through other things as well. It even melts through steel. Um, and um, if, you cannot, if you cannot keep flushing water through this core in order to remove that heat, then it's going to melt right down into the ground. And as it's doing so, it will give off radioactive gases and ashes and vapors into the air, which then gets into the food chain and so on. So that's what makes these nuclear reactors so dangerous. And that's why the meltdowns occurred in three of these reactors. Three of these reactors melted down, uh, three of six at Fukushima Daiichi. And they're still, they're still dealing with the consequences. <laughs> Here's the amazing thing, too, is that, as I told you, we don't know how to get rid of this waste material. We don't know how to neutralize it. We don't know how to stop the radioactivity. And the result is that 
there's still heat being generated even three years, four years after the accident. Like right now, we're more than three years after the accident. Okay, mm-hmm. there's still heat being generated by the fuel, even though it's melted down into the into the bottom of the reactors yeah. and maybe even into the ground. There's still heat being generated, and so the result is that even today, they have to pump about 400 tons of water down into the cores of those reactors and back up to the surface again in order to prevent it from even overheating again, from overheating more. And they're going to have to do this for at least at least seven or eight years, and maybe longer, maybe ten years. They're going to have to keep on flushing water through those melted-down cores. And when the water comes back to the surface, it's so radioactive that it can't be used for any purpose whatsoever, nor can it be dumped into the ocean. It's completely unsafe because it's full of these fission products. So they have built... They have built almost over a thousand large tanks, huge tanks, about three stories high, that contain this very, very radioactively contaminated water. And at the moment, they're trying to um, they're trying to filter out these uh, these fission products so that they can make the water pure enough that it's considered safe enough to dump back into the environment. But a lot of people, and especially the fishermen in northern Japan, are saying, "No, no, we don't want this. We don't want you to put this water back into the environment because it's impossible for them to remove all those hundreds of radioactive materials. They know how to remove about 62 of them, but there's more. There's other ones that they cannot remove. So, uh, so this is a problem which is ongoing in uh, in Japan today, and that's a problem worldwide. But wherever you have nuclear reactors." You have this possibility. The people in the industry say, well, wait a minute now. Um, We have really safe machines here. We have really safe reactors because they they have many cooling systems and they have emergency cooling systems and they have backup electrical systems and they have all kinds of ways of keeping the fuel cool even after it's shut down. They even cool the fuel for seven to ten years after it's shut down. Um... So you shouldn't be worried about it because we're looking after it. We're, we're, you know, we've got really good technology to look after it. And usually this is more or less true, you know. Like it is true that, they're, that they have wonderful devices for uh, protecting people. But the difficulty is what happens, for example, suppose you had an ordinary war, just an ordinary conventional war. God forbid, you know, but we have bombs exploding. Well, what happens if somebody blows up a nuclear power plant? Then you scatter this stuff all over. And uh, as somebody pointed out, this was a nuclear physicist, in fact. His name was Sir Brian Flowers. He wrote a report for the British government back in 1976. It was called the Flowers Report. It was, uh, the official title was the um, UK Environmental Commission on Nuclear Energy and the Environment. That's what the official title of the study was. And he had hearings, uh, um, mm-hmm. and then he wrote this report, and he said in the report, just to give people an idea of what we're facing here. He said, imagine that nuclear power had been developed before World War II, because, in fact, it was never developed until long after World War II. But imagine nuclear power had been developed before World War II and that they had existed. Nuclear power plants had been built in many of the large cities in Europe. Then, because of World War II, because of the conflict, uh, uh, the, the, the massive bombing and fighting that took place during World War II, large parts of Europe would be uninhabitable today because these plants would have been targeted by bombers, by sabotage. They would have been blown up, and this stuff would have been scattered all over the environment. And so large parts of Europe would be uninhabitable to this day. And um, this just shows you what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a very dangerous situation that, yes, science and technology is pretty good about uh, uh, building machines to safeguard us, but... You know, as human nature, we haven't changed that much. And you look around the world today and you see all the horrible things that are being done by people and you say, wow, (laughs) you can't just take a chance, you know, on having uh, things around that are going to ruin uh, your environment for God knows how long. It's going to make the whole Mm -hmm. planet or large parts of it uninhabitable. That's really the problem. 
Yeah, it is really a problem, and if they make it inhabitable, it really would be bad. Actually, I'd like to talk about Francesco Fonti, actually. He was the head of a Calabrese mafia, and he confessed to sinking 120 bales of radioactive waste. This was in the Mediterranean Sea. And by bring, like, but with this nuclear waste, can we ever get rid of the damage that they did? What is going to happen to the people that live there? What are the health risks? Where is that again? Um, that's in the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. Well, um, you know, we have uh, we know from science that uh, that cancer is one of the big killers, of course, in the world today. Um, we know that uh, that ninety percent of cancers, more than ninety percent of cancers, are caused by environmental factors. Uh, so it, it's not genetics plays a part in some cancers, but Genetics is not the main cause of cancer. The main cause of cancer is uh, environmental effects. And in particular, we've introduced into the environment a lot of cancer-causing chemicals, different kinds of cancer-causing chemicals. Well, um, radioactive materials are by themselves cancer-causing also. So they are among the cancer-causing elements, and they are among the most potent cancer-causing elements, uh, cancer-causing agents that we know of in the world. So a lot of people are uh, going to be getting cancer as a result of uh, radioactive contamination. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to be uh, completely destroyed. I mean, the population is not going to be completely destroyed because not everybody dies of cancer even when you have contamination. For example, even cigarette smoking is very bad, as we know, for causing cancer, right? Yeah, it is. Um, ten times more people who are smokers, ten times more uh, smokers get cancer than non-smokers. So smoking is very bad. But that doesn't mean that every single person who smokes is going to get cancer. It's not true. That uh, some people may live to be 110 and smoke all their lives, and they, for some reason, don't die of cancer. So the thing about these cancer-causing elements is that it causes a decrease in the health of the whole population, but it doesn't kill everybody. It kills, uh, uh, it kills a certain number of them. But radiation does other things besides causing cancer. It also causes um, genetic effects, genetic damage. And what that means is that, you know, like when a, when a young girl is born, uh, even when she comes out of the womb and is uh, just being raised as an infant, she has in her body all the eggs she's ever going to have. All the eggs that are going to represent future generations, they're already there. And so if this girl uh, is exposed to a damaging uh, radiation at a certain age, some of her eggs may be damaged in such a way that years and years later, when she grows up and marries and has children, uh, those children may turn out to have genetic problems, genetic defects, defective genes and chromosomes, as a result of damage that was done when she was very much younger. Mm -hmm. And and those her eggs, her genes are also going to be passed on to her children, who will then pass them on to their grandchildren. So this genetic damage may even show up like in the grandchildren or in the great grandchildren. So. Um, so there's not only cancer, but there's also genetic damage. And there's something else as well. A actually, there's a number of things about radiation. Yeah. Another thing about radiation is that what it does is it damages the immune system. It turns out that uh, when you, for example, when you get an infection, suppose you get a fever or, or uh, some kind of infection in your body, um, your body immediately starts fighting the infection using what are called antibodies. And uh, white blood cells play an important role in this, for example. Well, it turns out that radiation is particularly damaging to white blood cells. And the result is that your resistance to infectious diseases goes down. So the people who live in a radioactive environment, a more than usually radioactive environment, they have less resistance to um, uh, infectious diseases of all kinds. Uh, so the result is that it's a general weakening of the health of the population. And they've even discovered that uh, chronic exposure, chronic means day in, day out, you know, over a period of years, uh, chronic exposure to even low levels of radiation over a long period of time uh, can cause mental retardation as well. So that uh, even, even when mothers are exposed as they're pregnant, 
when they're exposed to radioactivity in their diet, for example, well, when they eat the food or drink the water, if it's radioactively contaminated, that food and that water goes to the embryo. It goes to the developing baby inside her. And uh, because the, the baby has priority over the nutrition, you know, that's baby's pretty important. <laughs> and uh, yeah. unfortunately, the baby, in getting this nutrition, also gets the radioactive material, and this can cause mental retardation. Depending upon the amount of radiation that's received, it turns out that the more the more radiation is received by the baby while it's still in the womb, uh, then the more mental retardation shows up later. So this is a real problem. They found this, for example, with the children of the survivors of Hiroshima. Uh, even the children who were in the womb at the time of the bombing of Hiroshima, uh, they showed mental retardation in direct relationship to the amount of uh, radiation that, they, that their mothers received. So uh, that's... Uh, that's why uh, this radioactive contamination um, is um, it, it's really uh, very, very, it's adding to the disease quotient of the human race, you might say. Alone, it's not going to eliminate the human race, but that's why the atomic bombs are far worse, because the atomic bombs not only spread the radioactive materials around, but they also, as I mentioned earlier, they destroy the cities, they destroy the medical mm -hmm. infrastructure, the schools and everything, and they also send out these uh, clouds of ashes that block out the sun, and that's actually, um, that's really threatening to the actual survival of the human race, not just, uh, not just, not just killing off a lot of people from various causes, but really um, or depriving people of even adequate food supplies, for example. So, so there's no question that nuclear weapons are the greatest threat but nuclear power plants uh, pose lesser threats, but nevertheless very serious ones. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Japan. Many people assumed that Japan would not turn, go back to nuclear, but that turns out to be all wrong. The Japanese public won against nuclear power after Fukushima, but the Prime Minister... The current one has been pushing to restart the nuclear reactors. The NRA will get public comment on the decision for a month before issuing the final decision. They say when September to November, they could be restarting it. I really hope that they do not restart those nuclear power plants. Yeah, well, that's an interesting uh, question because Japan, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, at the time of the accident, Japan had 54 nuclear reactors. At the present time, not one of those 54 reactors is operating. They're all shut down. And the reason they're shut down is because they weren't shut down immediately after the accident, but every year these, these plants have to be shut down temporarily in order to be... Um, uh, maintained, you know, they, they need maintenance, they need, uh, they need to have be worked upon. And when they're shut down, they need to get the permission of the local population before they can be started up. And it turns out that the local population all over Japan doesn't want these reactors to start up. So each reactor that was shut down for maintenance ended up being shut down for good. <laughs> And the result is that all 54 of them are shut down now. Now, of course, six of them have been mm -hmm. destroyed, so they talk now about 48 reactors because the Fukushima ones are a complete write-off. But um, they have tried. This, there are three Japanese prime ministers who are now out of office. They're ex-prime ministers. There are three of them uh, who have become completely anti-nuclear, even though each one of them was pro-nuclear when they were in office and they had... They defended nuclear power and they promoted nuclear power. But now that they are, uh, have seen what's happened with Fukushima, all three of these men have gone around the world and given speeches against nuclear power, not just against nuclear power in Japan, but against nuclear power in other countries as well. And one of the most outspoken of these is uh, ex-Prime Minister Tan, who was the Prime Minister at the time when the Fukushima accident happened. However, he has been replaced. In fact, he resigned. He resigned as a result. In the Japanese culture, they have a culture whereby people are supposed to accept responsibility for things that happen under their jurisdiction. You know, when they're the boss and something goes wrong, they are supposed to accept responsibility for that. And so he resigned, not because he did anything particularly wrong, but because he was the boss when the accident happened, and so he felt that he had to resign out of honor. Well, his replacement is uh, Prime Minister Abe, 
And Abe uh, has a completely different point of view. He wants very much to get these nuclear reactors restarted, and he is also trying his best to prevent information about the Fukushima disaster from getting out into the public. In fact, he's even passed a law. He, he introduced a law um, which makes it punishable uh, that people can be put into prison for fairly long periods of time for revealing information that they're not supposed to reveal. And part of this law is to uh, uh, is having the effect of uh, preventing people from... Uh, they're afraid to speak out about what's happening at, at Fukushima today. Even journalists who write stories about uh, things that the government does not approve of can be put into jail for fairly long periods of time. So um, this law is uh, really what you call a... Uh, a muzzling law. It muzzles people. And uh, it also has made it more difficult to find out what's going on. Now, uh, he wants to restart these reactors. And in fact, earlier this year, he uh, already uh, had permission, there, there was already permission given to restart two nuclear reactors at one location. But it went to court. Uh, many of the Japanese citizens took this to court, and they uh, and the court judge ruled that they cannot start restart this reactor because the reactors are not sufficiently safe to protect people, and people have a right to health and peace of mind and security. And uh, uh, restarting these reactors would uh, endanger those things. And so he ruled uh, in his court judgment. This is the first time this ever happened anywhere in the world that the court ruled that even though uh, this reactor has been given a license, it, it cannot be allowed to restart. Now, uh, the, uh, the, the Abe government is now trying with two other reactors to restart them, and they're doing this in a place where that same judge doesn't have jurisdiction. So they're hoping that they can get these other two reactors restarted. Um, and they have been given the go-ahead, and there has been a mm -hmm. lot of money spent in trying to improve the safety systems of these reactors and so on. You have to realize that it's not an easy problem. It's not an easy thing to keep these reactors shut down because Japan used to get 30% of its electricity from nuclear power. So when these reactors are all shut down, that means 30% of their electrical supply is out of, is out of commission. And that means that they have to buy other fuels from, uh, from outside Japan in order to generate electricity. And uh, so it's not an easy thing for the Japanese economy. And uh, for economic reasons, the Abe government wants to get these reactors restarted. But there still are many, many people in Japan, uh, some of them very highly placed, who uh, do not want to see these reactors restarted. I have to also say that Japan, the Abe government, is also trying to sell nuclear reactors to other countries. They're, they're working in collaboration with uh, some other partners to try and sell nuclear reactors to other countries. So it's, um, we have a real split here. We have a real split between one part of the Japanese society, uh, which happens to be right now in control of the government, which really wants to get these, uh, these reactors restarted and even to expand it in other countries. Um, but you know what? They're never going to be able to restart all these reactors. No way. Uh, at the very most, they might be able to restart maybe half of them, but they will not be able to restart them all because uh, some of them are unable to meet the, the new safety requirements which have been put down since Fukushima. They've made much more difficult safety requirements, and uh, not all these plants can meet that. In fact, some people say there's only about a dozen reactors that could even possibly be restarted under these new rules, um, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. Yeah, we do. The nuclear industry, why right, they, they are very corrupted. By being, by not telling the truth, I think they are, they're hurting themselves, their children, and the grandchildren. Well, um... You know, you can't, there's a lot of people in the nuclear industry who really believe they're doing a good thing and that they're serving humanity, and there's a lot of people even outside of the nuclear industry who have difficulty in seeing how the world can get enough energy to meet the energy needs without nuclear power, particularly given the fact that, um, that um, you know, the, the using fossil fuels, using coal and oil and natural gas, 
um, seems to be really damaging the climate in terms of the climate change and in terms of global warming. And one of the arguments, there's a couple of arguments in favor of nuclear power which carry a lot of weight with a lot of people. One of them is uh, the fact that when the nuclear reactor is running, uh, because it doesn't use fire to produce the heat, but it uses this nuclear fission instead, this splitting of the atoms, because it doesn't use fire, it does not add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And therefore, it doesn't contribute to the global warming problem, to the climate change problem. And so that's attractive to people. The other thing is that the uh, uranium is so, as I mentioned earlier, the amount of energy you can get from a uranium atom is millions of times greater than what you can get from a chemical reaction. And therefore, the energy is very, very concentrated. You can have a small amount of fuel which will produce a lot of energy. And both of these things are very attractive to people. Um, the danger, of course, is that you can't really use this fuel without producing these nuclear waste that I was talking about, the fission products, which are da very dangerous things mm -hmm. and which we don't know how to destroy. But the other thing, which is even worse, in my opinion, is the fact that it also produces plutonium. So that as you're running the reactor, you're producing plutonium all the time. And plutonium has a, a lifetime of tens of thousands of years. It has a so-called half-life of 24,000 years. That means that once you produce plutonium, um, you have to wait 24,000 years before half of it is gone. Because the reason it's gone after 24,000 years is because the atoms disintegrate. The atoms are disintegrating, and when they disintegrate, they change into something else. But still, 24,000 years is such an enormously long period of time what this means is that once we create this plutonium, anybody can come along, like some other government can come along uh, 10,000 years from now and make atomic bombs out of this plutonium. So uh, we have created a problem that's going to last for generation after generation after generation, tens of thousands of years, longer than the pyramids of Egypt have existed, right? Yeah. Um, for the sake of what, 20 or 30 years of electricity? So you get 20 or 30 years worth of electricity, and then you have like hundreds of thousands of years of, uh, of headaches and problems for the human race, sorrows, you might say, uh, which at any time could, could lead to the, the destruction of the entire planet even. So this is, uh, this is really a bad trade-off in a lot of people's opinion. Now, I've still looked at this problem myself carefully, and I have to admit it's by no means a simple problem, and anybody who thinks it's simple... Um, is underestimating the problem. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem for sure. But what we're seeing right now is that wind and solar energy are already making huge inroads into, uh, into the energy scene. For example, Germany. After Fukushima happened, Germany had 17 nuclear reactors at that time. They shut down eight of them right away, immediately, permanently, and they have pledged to, to get rid of all of their nuclear reactors by 2020, which is just around the corner. You know, it's only about another five years. Yeah. Well, in the process of doing this, and since doing this, they have built a huge amount of wind power and also solar energy. And in fact, last year, just in the last calendar year, it turns out that 31% of all the electricity used in Germany was generated by renewable energy sources. That means it was renew generated by wind and solar energy, 31%. Now, if you remember, I told you a, a little while ago that Japan got 30% of its electricity from nuclear. Yes, I do remember that. Well, here they've got 30% of their electricity from renewables yeah. in a much shorter period of time and without any of the dangers associated with nuclear power. So what uh -huh. this does is this, this shows that, uh, that people may have the wrong idea. They may have, uh, the, they may have underestimated the contribution that can be made by renewable energy. And don't forget, solar and wind are only two forms of renewable energy. There are other forms of renewable energy, such as geothermal energy. It means, you know, that we all know that the Earth is extremely hot in the core. You know, it's all molten, molten we see a volcano erupting, and we see this, this stuff coming out of the volcano. Well, where does it come from? It comes from the center of the Earth. Well, um, geothermal energy means taking advantage of the heat of the Earth itself 
in order to uh, produce energy. And in Iceland, they heat entire cities using geothermal energy. And there are geothermal plants in various parts of the world, California, New Zealand, and a few other places, where they generate electricity from geothermal energy. So uh, these are things that we have not even begun to develop. You know, that, that we're just beginning. We're just beginning. And um, I feel myself that people have overestimated the importance of nuclear energy, and they've underestimated the importance of these renewable energies. And uh, if you actually take a look at the nuclear energy in the world, it's already gone down from 17% of electricity back in 2005, in the year 2005, 17% of all the electricity in the world was actually generated by nuclear electricity, mm -hmm. which is pretty significant, of course. But now it's mm -hmm. already down to almost 10%. So it's dropped from 17% to 10%. At the same time, renewable energy has gone way, way up, and uh, it's going up much faster. In fact, nuclear power is uh, basically at a standstill and even going negative. In Canada, for instance, we have less nuclear power today than we had 10 years ago, and in the United States also we have less nuclear power than we had 10 years ago because nuclear plants are being shut down. Uh, here in Ontario, for example, uh, I, I live in Quebec, but just next door in Ontario, mm -hmm, yes, where they have 20 nuclear reactors, well, uh, two of those reactors are already permanently shut down, and six more are going to be permanently shut down within five years, permanently shut down. So that's eight reactors gone uh, within, within less than 10 years. And, uh, and there's no new reactors that are on the drawing board to be built in uh, Ontario. So, so nuclear power is actually on the decline worldwide. And although people often say that we can't really meet the world's energy needs with, uh, with renewable energy, um, here's a fact that many people don't know, but you can check this out. It turns out that long before human civilization came along, mm -hmm. we had vegetation all over the world trees, plants of all sorts. And the green color, the green color that we see in vegetation is due to a chemical compound called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is an amazing chemical that allows the plant to take the solar energy from the sun and build all the, all the things that we eat. For example, peaches, apples, uh, pears, bananas, you know, and, and all the leaves and all the wood that we build homes and other things with, all of that stuff is 90% of it is solar energy. It's built with the solar energy from the sun. And all those leaves, those green leaves, are actually solar collectors. They're collecting solar energy all the time. And um, science still doesn't understand exactly how chlorophyll works, how, how the plant manages to actually use that solar energy so effectively to make all these chemical compounds, all these carbohydrates and foods for us and everything. But... If you look at the amount of solar energy that's captured by wild vegetation every year, it's about 80 times greater than all the energy that's used by human civilization on Earth. 80 times greater. So anybody who says solar energy can't do the job, I think it just isn't thinking about the future. It just isn't thinking about the past either. Because in both the past and the future, as a matter of fact, even the fossil fuels, you know when we talk about fossil fuels? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is fossil fuel? It's oil and coal, right? Yes, it is. And where did that come from? It came from vegetation. It came yes. from, the reason it's called fossil fuels is because these are from primeval forests that fell into the mud and got buried under rock and got pressurized and turned into oil. It's actually a derived from plant material and animal material. That's why it's called fossil fuels. And that's actually, you know what that is? That's solar energy. Mm -hmm. That's solar energy that oh. has been trapped into these fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So solar yes. energy has always been, has always been the most important economical source of energy, even in Canada. For example, what is it that grows our crops? Solar energy. What is it that feeds our fish? Solar energy. What is it that grows our lumber and our pulp and paper for the pulp and paper industry? Solar energy. So, and what even heats our homes? Well, the, the sunlight that comes through the windows is heating our homes whether we know it or not. And when we use coal or oil or 
any other form of electrical heating to all we're doing is we're supplementing the solar energy that's already there so solar energy is already contributing a great deal to our economy it's far more important than oil or gas or any of these other things except that we don't measure it the only difference is that we don't measure it now if we started measuring it started using it and started capturing it I think we have no idea as to what we can accomplish and the nice thing is to think about solar energy in this regard too and by the way Mm -hmm. Wind is also a form of solar energy yes. because it's the sunshine, it's the heat of the sun that, that creates the winds. You know, the temperature differences that mm -hmm. makes the winds blow? Yes, sir. There's no winds on Mars <laughs> mm, <yeah. laughs> because they don't really have the atmosphere that we have. Yes. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Or the moon. I should have said the moon, really. There is a yes. bit of a wind on Mars, but there isn't any, any uh, yeah. wind on, on, on the moon because there's no atmosphere. But... Um, so I, I, feel that, uh, I feel that as humans, we should realize that maybe we're at the end of an era. You know, just like the Dark Ages gave way to the Renaissance, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, yes. things change. Things change. Human, humans learn things. And maybe, maybe we're mm -hmm. at a turning point. Maybe we're, maybe we're at a time when we can say, well, let's stop doing things the way we've been doing them that has ended up poisoning the earth, and let's try and do something that is good for the earth and also good for human society. Now, here's something to think about. If the world were to be able to meet its energy needs using solar energy and wind power, then there would be a lot less incentive to go to war because a lot of the wars that are fought are fought over oil or natural resources. And if you don't need that oil, you don't need those natural resources, then there's less likely to be these violent conflicts and these violent wars. And uh, the other, another thing that's worth thinking about, too, is that when a community, even a small village, when a small village can get most of its own energy from wind and from sun, it means that they're economically better off because they don't have to think of all the money they have to pay every year to pay to some big company for the oil or the natural gas or the electricity that they have to use. To, to, to satisfy their energy needs. If they don't have to do that, then that energy will stay in the community and they'll have a much more beneficial economic community. So I believe that there's many... People really have to start using their imagination and realizing that maybe the old way of doing things is not really the best, that maybe these new ways... And by the way, it really is happening. Mm -hmm. It really is happening. Anybody who's interested can go on the Internet and find out how much wind and solar energy has been increasing over the last few years. It's phenomenal. And what's been happening with nuclear power over the last 10 years, it's pathetic. Mm -hmm, of course. And there is a company called Laser Power Systems. I plan on bringing in a foreign power car, nuclear power, which will run for 100 years with 8 grams of fuel. Will that be harmful to the environment? Uh, I'm not sure about that particular system, but oftentimes when they talk about these new... Th that's a nuclear system, is it? Um, yes, yes it is. Yeah, well, there are often... There is a lot of talk about these uh, uh, new nuclear reactors, small nuclear reactors, small modular nuclear reactors. There's also talk about um, um, what's called liquid, uh, liquid fuel reactors and mm -hmm. so on. Yes. The trouble with all of these uh, plans, the uh, trouble with all of these proposals is they don't really solve the problem of nuclear waste because uh, these highly dangerous byproducts as a result of splitting the uranium atom, we still don't know how to get rid of them. And uh, so to say that this is a clean source of energy is really not correct because, in fact, all, the only reason it's considered clean is because they keep these very dangerous materials uh, carefully guarded and carefully contained. But who's going to look after them for the next 100,000 years? <laughs> That's the problem. Because the waste lasts far longer than human society has ever existed. In fact, humans have only been on this planet uh, for a couple of million years. And uh, human society, human civilization, has only been around for what? About maybe 10,000 years? That's really a drop in the bucket compared with these nuclear wastes. So the other danger is that I have yet to see any nuclear system which doesn't open the door to diverting some of the materials in that system for nuclear weapons. 
even the liquid, the, 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 there's a new system that gets a lot of talk. It's called thorium thorium power. I don't know if you heard that word, thorium. Yes, yes I have. Well, thorium uh, nuclear reactors that are liquid fuel reactors. Well, I've uh, uh, I've discovered that uh, that those reactors also have a weapons connection. That anybody who wants to make bombs, nuclear weapons, instead of or in addition to making electricity, can do so. And uh, so my belief is that let, let me make a, let me make a, make a parallel. Um, yeah. Are you familiar with asbestos? Um, yes, I am. Well, asbestos once upon a time was considered wonderful. In fact, I can remember as a kid, uh, asbestos was considered to be great because mm -hmm. you know it was fireproofing and all that sort of thing. If, if you used, if you had an asbestos suit, you could walk through fire and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But mm -hmm. it turns out that asbestos is extremely harmful, very, very harmful in yeah. very minute amounts. And as a result of that, asbestos has been banned from uh, the from use in North America, although it's still being used in the third world in some countries like India, for example, um, because it's so harmful to human health. They even used to use asbestos in the brake linings of automobiles, but every time an automobile would use the brakes, there would be a few asbestos fibers, little fibers, they're invisible, that would be released into the air. And each one of these asbestos fibers is quite able to cause cancer in a human being. So that if somebody breathes in one of these fibers, they get a, they develop a ter they can develop a terrible cancer, which will kill them. And uh, that fiber remains in the lungs, and you can find it there in an autopsy later on. So as a result of this, they have banned the use of your of asbestos in brake linings and in buildings and they've realized now that nobody would nobody nowadays would recommend opening a new asbestos mine they say no 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 leave it in the ground do not mine this stuff it's far too dangerous the dangers are much greater than any possible benefits from it well that's the same attitude that i think we should have towards uranium and towards nuclear power we should say not to deny that there have been benefits. Let's be honest. There have been benefits. There has been electricity generated and so on, and that electricity has been used for a multitude of purposes. And there have been other things done with uranium which have been beneficial. But the dangers far outweigh the benefits, and they far outlast the benefits. Because, in fact, if you look at a nuclear reactor, people think of it as a source of electricity, but actually the electricity is only there for 20 or 30 years. And then all there is for the next hundreds of thousands of years afterwards is problems for the human race. So we've created a whole legacy of problems that's virtually unending for the sake of a temporary benefit. It just doesn't seem like a good deal. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about space-based weapons. Are space-based weapons the same thing as nuclear weapons? Not necessarily. Space-based weapons, uh, you could even use solar energy as a space-based weapon, strictly speaking. I mean, you could focus the sun's beams on a city and set fire to it, you know? <laughs> you know, like a magnifying glass, how you yes. can focus it and start a fire with it? Yes, um, Space-based weapons, uh, you, you see, this is what it really comes down to. <laughs> There's really a larger question here. It's not just a question of weapons. It's a question of war itself. We have to put an end to war. We really have to put an end to war. And that means we have to put an end to armies. We have to eliminate armies. The whole, you know, once upon a time, uh, cannibalism was not uncommon in the human race. Well, we've eliminated that. Not so long ago, dueling was considered acceptable. Two men would get into an argument and they would go out and shoot each other, you know, or, or, or sword fight each other to death <laughs> because of some argument they had. Well, that's been outlawed, you know. We have to outlaw. Mm -hmm. We have to outlaw war, and we have to outlaw armies. Uh, it should be uh, against international law for anybody to have armies, uh, because with the weapons that we're developing, and uh, these space-based weapons are just another example. We've got chemical weapons. We've got biological weapons. We've got nuclear weapons. With the various weapons that we're developing. All we're doing is killing more and more human beings and making more and more uh, parts of the world uh, into wastelands. Um, how is this advancing the happiness of the human race or the sustainability of the planet or the health of the human race? 
I think that, that we really have to, as the question really is, is the human race going to survive its own ingenuity or not? Now, if you look at the four billion year evolution of life on Earth, we all know the story about how we started with life in the oceans and how it came onto land and then the dinosaurs and then the mammals and so on. Well, this is an evolutionary crisis because for the first time in the four billion year evolution of life on Earth, we have one species of animal, which is us, that has developed the power to ruin the entire planet through our weapons mostly through our weapons and through our warfare. And if we, if we are not going to go the way of the dinosaurs, at least the dinosaurs didn't do themselves in. They were done in by something from outer space probably. But if we're not going to go the way of the dinosaurs by our own ingenuity, by our own weapons, we're going to have to say, what's the point of having war? Because the idea of war is a very ancient idea in a time when it was possible for one side to win the war and the other side would lose the war. And so uh, you would have a victor, uh, you know, a winner and a loser. But nowadays with these weapons, nobody wins. Everybody loses. Everybody loses. Because, for example, with nuclear warfare, um, nobody benefits from this. Nobody really survives intact. So what's the point of it? And I think that we have to get to the point where we realize that war itself has to become obsolete or else the human race is going to become obsolete. So these space-based weapons are basically uh, just another extension of warfare and a deadly extension of warfare. Because it's space-based, it means that you can destroy huge uh, numbers of people and huge tracts of land and even large parts of cities from space. And again, what is the exact advantage of this? Because you can be sure that whatever weapon you're going to develop, if you have enemies, they're going to develop those weapons too, or they're going to acquire those weapons. And so you're back into a situation where you do not have any advantage. It's to everybody's mutual disadvantage. So I, I believe that, that uh, it's really a question of survival of the human race, whether we can have the good sense for the large number of people on the planet who, who believe that this is insanity, to stand up and say, we have to have peace, and the only way we can have peace is to get rid of all the paraphernalia and instruments of warfare, including armies. Now, you know who said this was uh, a U.S. general, the U.S. general mm -hmm. Eisenhower, who was in charge of the uh, Operation Overlord, which was the invasion of uh, Europe that led to the end of the Second World War in Europe, uh, you know, the Allied invasion of Europe. Yeah. He was in charge mm -hmm. of all that, and he became U.S. president later on. And he talked about this, and he said that someday the people of the earth are going to stand up and demand peace. And uh, all of the political leaders and generals are going to have to give it to them because that's that's what they demand. I think it is very important for people to realize that the leadership on these issues that are global issues, issues of global survival, they come from the grassroots and go up the chain. They don't come from the top down. They go from the grassroots up. And uh, th this is true for, for example, the women's movement. It's true for the human rights movement. It's true for, uh, for example, if you think about the civil rights movement in the United States to end slavery and to, to end discrimination uh, of uh, black people in uh, the USA. Um, if you think about the environmental movement, the anti-nuclear mm -hmm. movement, the anti-war movement, all of these movements go from the grassroots up. It's the leadership comes from ordinary people and the leaders are the last ones to know about it, and they're the last ones to act upon it. But that's where the leadership comes from. Yes, yeah, so the leadership does come from there. And I did watch a good movie, right, a few, uh, the night, a few nights ago, right, called the China Syndrome, nineteen. Oh, yes. <laughs> you watched it? Yes, I know that movie very well. There's quite a story about yeah. that, I can tell you about it. But that, that's about a, a, a meltdown or a potential meltdown, not a real meltdown, but a potential meltdown yeah. in a reactor uh, in, 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 the, in the movie. Mm -hmm. With Jane Fonda and uh, um, Jack, Jack Lemmon yep. and uh, uh, Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah. 
But I'll tell you something. Uh, you may not know this. Yeah, sure. But both Jane Fonda, who's in that movie, and she's very good in it, and Jack Lemmon, who's also in that movie, they both made movies before, which were basically anti-nuclear movies, which were to call attention to the dangers of nuclear power. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, they were prevented from releasing these movies by the nuclear industry who took them to court and got an injunction which prevented them from showing these movies publicly. Jack Lemmon made a movie, uh, he financed it himself, called The Powers That Be, and it was a movie criticizing the nuclear industry. Nobody has ever seen this movie in the public because it was never released because the nuclear industry sued him and and got a court order preventing him from showing it. Same thing happened to Jane Fonda. I don't know what the title of her movie was, but she wasn't allowed to show hers either. So they got together, and they actually hired three nuclear engineers from General Electric who had resigned from General Electric because of their concerns about nuclear safety. And these men were called Breidenbaugh, Miner, and Hubbard, three men. I I, I met uh, Miner years later in Saskatchewan. I had a nice talk with him, and he explained to me why he quit the nuclear industry. But these guys were, dis- were top-notch engineers in the nuclear field who had resigned because they were concerned about safety. And they hired these three men to write the script of the, to help them with the script of the uh, China Syndrome movie so that everything in the movie that happens, that they show in the movie, the technical things that go wrong, everything is based upon an actual incident that happened in an actual nuclear reactor in the United States that is well documented. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that... So that the industry could not argue that this was um, uh, unrealistic or, or unbelievable because, in fact, all of these things had really happened in other nuclear power plants. Not the same plant, but various nuclear power plants. And so um, they were able to get this, re- this picture released because of the fact that uh, it was the uh, technology was so accurately portrayed. Yeah, that, they're trying to cover up information or hide things, you know. I'm not surprised that they would do that to them, you know. I'll tell you, some, I'll tell you something else that's yeah. remarkable. Yes. I don't know how many of your listeners uh, remember that there was an accident in the United States called the Three Mile Island accident. Yes, yes. Uh, and well, not everybody has heard of this, but it was a, par- it was a partial m- nuclear meltdown in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, it happened in 1979. And um, it was quite a, uh, a very, very dramatic event. And uh, the, whole, the whole of North America was on pins and needles for, for weeks until that accident sort of seemed to get finally under control. But for, for several days, they didn't know what was happening. And there were, in fact, a few explosions that were going on, too, and so on. And there was a melting of the core of the reactor. Well... Here's something that you might not know, but just, I believe it was a week or two before that accident happened in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, guess what movie was playing in the local theater? The what? Chi- the, the China Syndrome. Oh, really? <laughs> the China Syndrome was playing in Harrisburg theaters just before that accident actually occurred in Harrisburg. And one of the lines in the movie, if you remember, uh, is that the uh, one of the uh, people in the movie says, that if, if there was a meltdown, then you could have an area contaminated the size of Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And the Three Mile Island yes, accident happened in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so so it, was, it was, and, and here's another thing that's yeah. very interesting, is that mm-hmm. the same week that the, that the China Syndrome was showing in Harrisburg, the nuclear industry took out a full-page ad in the New York Times saying that, that this film should not be taken seriously because it uh, doesn't correspond to reality at all and that we have all these safety systems. And, in fact, you could not have a meltdown in an American nuclear reactor. And that was just like a matter of weeks before the Harrisburg meltdown. So <laughs> it's uh, mm-hmm. quite, a, quite a remarkable... I lived through those events, and I remember them quite vividly. But, of course, uh, it, it's very ironic that, uh, that it should have happened together with that meltdown. Mm-hmm, yes. Oh, how, oh, this is so interesting. I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yes. <laughs> yes, these nuclear reactors are becoming old and outdated. Should we expect to see more meltdowns? Well, of course, one would hope not, but unfortunately, uh, you know, machines do break down, and some of the uh, breakdowns have been, well, some of them have been really alarming. Um, there was a... Um, 
a case of uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I remember the name of the reactor. I think it was the Davis Bessie reactor, but I may be getting the wrong name. There's a reactor on Lake Michigan uh, where they found that the uh, I should explain that the the in the United States they have a different type of reactor than we have here in Canada. It's called a light water reactor. We have what are called heavy water reactors. And the only difference is that they use ordinary water, which is light water, just the kind of water that you might use uh, to drink, except that it's very purified. Whereas we in Canada use heavy water uh, for technical reasons. It's the same as ordinary water, except it's a little bit heavier. Each molecule is a little heavier than ordinary water because the hydrogen atoms are heavier. They're not radioactive, but they're heavier. And that's why it's called heavy water. Well, anyway, in the United States, they have these huge vertical vessels, which are uh, kind of uh, like, a, like a vertical tube uh, with a, uh, the very thick walls and a, a very thick top called a head. And it's inside that vessel, it's inside that vessel that the uh, chain reaction takes place with the uranium fuel. And so, as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of heat being generated inside the reactor vessel and a lot of pressure and a lot of radiation as well because while it's uh, undergoing this uh, chain reaction, you have all this radioactivity going on. Well, it's very important that this vessel not, be, uh, not break. If the vessel breaks for any reason, then you, uh, the fuel is uh, no longer cooled because, you know, the vessels is how you keep the water, how you keep the fuel cooled. You pump water through this vessel at an enormous pressure in order to remove the heat all the time, like I told you before, so that it doesn't overheat. If that vessel were to break, then you would have, uh, almost inevitably, you'd have a meltdown because how would you cool the fuel? You wouldn't have a vessel to do it in. You wouldn't have a pot anymore, as it were. So they discovered at one reactor, this is just a couple of years ago, that the head of the reactor had been gradually being eaten away by acid that was dripping on it over a period of years and years and years. This acid had been dripping, drip, 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 drip. And it had, mm -hmm. it had eaten away the metal to the point where there were only a few centimeters left, just a couple of centimeters left of metal that prevent and if it had gone much further, it would have gone all the way through, and then you would have had a terrible accident. So um, uh, the, the, there's two things here that really uh, frighten me. One is the fact that this kind of thing can happen. First of all, <laughs> um, and the second thing is that it can go unnoticed for such a long period of time. Um, and and why does it go unnoticed? Well, the reason it goes unnoticed is because you can't send human beings into the reactor area um, because it's too radioactive. So you have to use remote instruments. You have to use remote instruments to tell you what's going on. You can't send men in there. You'd be sending them to their death. When the Three Mile Island accident happened, the one that we talked about before, um, here's what happened. Uh, inside the reactor building, there was a, a valve you know what a valve is, right? It's like a little trap door. Mm -hmm. sort of. There was a valve that stuck open. It was supposed to open to relieve the pressure, and then it was supposed to close again automatically. You know, like it, it's sort of like when the pressure gets too high, the little valve pops open and the steam goes out just to relieve the pressure, and then it closes again. Well, what happened was this valve opened, and it never closed again. It stuck open. And because it's stuck open, the water from the primary cooling system, the stuff that goes through the core of the reactor to cool the reactor, was going out through that hole. That valve was stuck open, and it was going out for two days without anybody noticing what was going on. And how could they not notice? Well, the reason they couldn't notice is because they couldn't go in there to look. They had to rely upon the instruments, and it took them two and a half days to figure out that the water was escaping through this hole. And that's why there was a meltdown, because the water, as was, the water level in the core of the reactor was gradually going down, 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 down. And eventually it went down so far that the core of the reactor was uncovered, which meant it was no longer being cooled and started to melt. But the guys in the control room, there were hundreds of guys in the control room. They were flown in from all over the country, experts of all kinds. They could not figure out for two and a half days what the heck was going on. And they couldn't go in and look because it was impossible to do so. So this is, again, another indication of 
what makes uh, nuclear power particularly dangerous is you can't... Two things that make it particularly dangerous, or three things, I guess. One is you can't shut it off and make it safe. You still have to keep cooling it for seven to ten years after it's shut off, believe it or not. What kind of a machine is that? It doesn't even have a, sh- a real proper shutdown system properly. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't really shut off. The heat generation keeps on going for years afterwards. The second thing is the radioactivity is so intense that you can't send people in to look at it. So that's, that's a serious thing. And, and these things contribute to the fact that when things do go wrong in a nuclear reactor, they can go very wrong. Mm-hmm. Who discovered nuclear power? Well, nuclear power, actually, it was, it was kind of an accidental discovery. A lot of discoveries are sort of accidental. Uh, they're not really totally accidental, but, you know, like people don't expect to find what they find. Mm-hmm. There were two scientists. Okay, this is a long story, but maybe I'll just quickly encapsulate it, okay? Yep. Back in 1896, in Paris, France, there was a man named Henri Becquerel, and he discovered radioactivity. He discovered that uranium is radioactive. It means it gives off, it, because the atoms are disintegrating, it gives off this radioactive energy, which we now know is quite da- dangerous, but which is quite remarkable. We're, we're, how does these atoms give off energy all by themselves? Nobody, nobody could understand that at the time, and it's still very mysterious today. Anyway, he discovered radioactivity. Now, um, through the first part of the 20th century, they used radioactive materials. Radium they used and other radioactive materials were used for scientific purposes and sometimes for medical purposes. Um, But it wasn't until 1938, which is, you know, well into the 20th century, it wasn't until 1938 that uh, two scientists working in Berlin around Christmas time Found out, made this amazing discovery that when they when they bombarded a sample of uranium, which already they knew it was radioactive, but when they bombarded it with these particles called neutrons, they had di- discovered neutrons and they were able to use a kind of a neutron gun to shoot neutrons at a sample of something. And when mm-hmm. they shot it at the uranium, uh, they got uh, this strange result, which they did not understand, and they couldn't figure it out, and so they, they had a colleague who was a Jewish woman named Lise Meitner, and she had escaped Germany because of the Nazis. She had gone to live with Niels Bohr in Denmark uh, for safety reasons, right? But she was a very smart yes. woman, and they, they wrote her, and they said, Lise, can you tell us what's going on here? We've been bombarding this uranium with uh, neutrons, and we've got these results which we do not understand. And she looked at their results, and she said, I think that you've split the atom. I think that you've actually split the uranium atom because the things that you're seeing that you don't understand, those are actually broken pieces of uranium atoms. The, uh, and nobody knew about this possibility before. So she said, I think, you've, I think you've split the uranium atom. So she's the one who actually uh, put her finger on the actual discovery of nuclear fission. This idea that you can split the uranium atom and get, and get energy and more neutrons made it possible to build an atomic bomb. And within a short period of time, from ni- this is around Christmas of 1938, by 1939, by, by the middle of 1939, there were scientists all over the world who had the idea that, that, that this might have a very exciting possibility. Maybe you could make a bomb with it, but maybe you could also use it as an energy source. It wasn't until uh, a couple of years later that they actually figured out how to what would be needed to make an atomic bomb. And that was done by the British and the Americans independently. There was actually European scientists who had escaped to Britain and to America who carried this information with them. And that's when the Manhattan Project, the World War II atomic bomb project, was launched. And the Manhattan Project was this project that Canada participated in indirectly through the Britain, British connection, through the Quebec Accord, to build the world's first atomic bombs, and they needed uranium as a raw material for two purposes. First, they could separate out a, re- uh, a rare kind of uranium called uranium-235. This is called weapons-grade uranium. They could separate out this uranium-235. It wasn't easy to do. It took a long time to do it, 
but they were able to separate the U-235 out, and that's what they that's what they used for the Hiroshima bomb was this rare kind of uranium, highly enriched uranium they call it. But the other uranium was used in nuclear reactors to to be converted into plutonium, which they also knew could be used to make a bomb, and that gave rise to the second bomb. So um, after the war, they had reactors. The only reactors that were originally built were built to produce plutonium for bombs. That was the purpose of them. But while they were producing plutonium, they were also producing an enormous amount of heat. Like I told you, they have to use a lot of water to keep the, the core mm -hmm. of the reactor from overheating, right? Yes. So somebody got the bright idea and said, hey, since we're generating plutonium anyway... And since we have all this waste heat, why don't we use the waste heat to boil water and we can use it to generate electricity as a byproduct? So the, the idea of generating electricity came as a, as a secondary idea, as a way of using the waste heat from the nuclear reactor that was being used to produce plutonium. And when they built nuclear reactors in, in Britain, to, uh, they used it for two purposes. They used it to produce plutonium for bombs and to produce electricity for civilian use. So the two purposes were not separated out in two separate machines. They had one machine that did both. It produced the plutonium for the bombs and the electricity for the civilians. The same thing happened in Russia with Chernobyl. You know the Chernobyl accident that happened in Ukraine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, that reactor, many people don't know it, but it was designed also as a dual-purpose reactor. It was designed to produce plutonium for weapons purposes and also to produce electricity for civilian use. So... It shows you very clearly that there's not a sharp dividing line between the military and the civilian, that they're closely related, mm -hmm. and that anybody who wants to use them for both purposes can do so. But the idea, the, it wasn't until 1953. Now, the war ended in 1945. That's when the first atomic bombs were used. A lot more atomic bombs were built after that, you know, the beginning of the buildup of nuclear weapons. In 1953, President Eisenhower went to the United Nations and he made his famous speech in which he announced to the world that that we could use this, uh, that we should we should be using this uranium and this nuclear power for peaceful purposes, not for military purposes. And he said we should be beating our nuclear swords into plowshares. This is a quotation from the Bible. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. The idea is that. Swords, of course, are for killing. Plowshares are for growing food uh, because a plowshare is just a, a, a plow, a way of plowing the land to sow your crops and grow food. So beating our swords into plowshares is a, is a phrase from the Bible. And Eisenhower made this speech in 1953 uh, called the Adams for Peace speech in which he suggested that we should beat our swords into plowshares. Now, when people heard this speech, they were very enthusiastic and they said, oh, that sounds wonderful, because the implication was that we were going to get rid of the nuclear weapons and only use nuclear power for peaceful purposes. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. What happened was they kept on building more and more bombs, as well as building more and more nuclear reactors. And the two were not, in fact, incompatible at all. The two were side by side. So nuclear power really began, you might say, since 1953, when, uh, when that word went out from uh, the Eisenhower speech. And that's when uh, peaceful nuclear reactors started being built in various countries of the world. There's now over 400 reactors in the world, electricity-producing reactors. There's also a lot of other smaller reactors that are used for either research purposes, just for, you know, like a, like a, a not to generate electricity, but just to do research with. And uh, there's also reactors which are used so only for military purposes. And then there's also reactors which are used in nuclear submarines as a propulsion unit to propel the nuclear submarines. It's kind of like the engine, the engine of the nuclear submarine. So those mm -hmm. are the main uses of, uh, of nuclear reactors. Yes. Could you please give us your website and where people can find you? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the website, the, my organization is uh, called the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. And we were formed in 1975. And uh, 
We were formed really um, for two reasons. The reason why there were about 30 people who joined together to to create this organization in Montreal, Quebec, uh, down near Concordia University. Uh, I remember very vividly, I was one of the people sitting around and, and deciding on, on creating this organization in order to, we had two purposes. The purpose was, number one, to contact mm-hmm. groups across the country that wanted to know more about nuclear power and nuclear weapons so that we could supply good information. And that our, was our main goal. And the second goal was to combine with all the other groups that join us that we wanted to put pressure on the government of Canada to have a public inquiry into nuclear power and nuclear weapons for the purpose of getting a good, solid information base for decision makers so that decision makers and the Canadian public knew all the benefits and all the hazards of these technologies. So that uh, because at at those days, you have to understand that people didn't know anything. They were really kept completely in the dark. And so we felt it was really necessary to shine a light on this technology so that people could begin to learn about it. And that's basically what our website is about, too. It's found at www.ccnr, the initials of Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, ccnr.org. Of course, the ORG means it's not a commercial uh, profit-making thing. It's a non-commercial, non-profit-making organization. And so it's www.ccnr.org. And uh, there's also, on every page of the website, there's a, um, an icon at the bottom, which is a mail icon, which if you click on, it'll send an email actually to me. I, I'm the one who will get the email. Uh, and you can write and ask questions or, or send comments or uh, request more information about this or that. We try to keep the web, or also if you have any suggestions about how to improve the website, we're always happy about that as well. Um, my email address is ccnr at web.ca. ccnr at web.ca. Mm-hmm. Sure to go check out his website, it's ccnr.org. That's it. Yes. So thank you for coming on to Crystal Kids Radio show. It was truly a pleasure for having you, and I would like to have you back on my radio show in the near future. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me on Crystal Kids Radio. Support us kids on Crystal Kids Radio's website, www.crystalkidsradio.com, and my social media, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, or Google. Please support us kids because it takes a lot of work doing and it comes from my heart. Thanks. Start some children. Peace, love, and harmony. See you next week at the same time, same place. Love you all.